I can imagine most of us have had the experience of being in primary school and maybe if you're a lad you see a girl that you might kind of like or vice versa and in primary school dating is very very easy because uh, when you're out in the playground you just get a ball or a rock and, and, and you throw it at the girl that you like and then if it hits her especially if she's a country girl she might chase you and then if she finds you she might actually give you a dead arm and you go home thinking she touched me. <laughs> uh, so it's very easy in primary school. It gets a little more compl complex in secondary school, where girls have to arrange that when uh, Jacko is coming out of the class, just get all the girlfriends and just push me into him. You know what I mean? Push me into, oh! All right, and, uh, uh, or maybe you can set up a, a questionnaire. Do you like my friend? Yes, no, or maybe. And, you know, all this kind of thing. So things get a little more advanced in secondary school. Once you move on then to, to college age, then that's where if I get drunk enough, then I can go talk to her, right? Then things become really sophisticated. Um, a friend of mine uh, from the States was at a house party and wanted to impress uh, a girl, actually the, the host, apparently, uh, of the house party. So he was talking to her and, you know, just kind of making conversation. Just uh, So are these your, these your goldfish? And she said, yeah, they're my, they're my goldfish. And he said, oh, cool. So he reaches in, grabs one, and puts it into his mouth. And um, the tail is left sticking out. And she's, she's standing there going. And then he goes, watch it. And he swallows it. And um, all of that to, to impress her. Needless to say that that relationship didn't go very far. In fact, that, I think, was, was, was the end of it. Um, so the point being, uh, often... We will do the strangest, dare I say, the most horrific of things to get a girl's attention, all right? Or to get a guy's attention, right? So it's the same for yourselves. Uh, so when, when, you, when, there is an, uh, when there's an, an attraction there, uh, reason goes out the window. You start to do stupid things just to get someone's attention so that they might like you, all right? You, want, you just want to kind of open that door somehow. You just want to have some kind of a, a connection, even if it's kind of negative. Even a negative connection is worse than no connection, is better than no connection at all. She hates me. At least she knows you exist, you know what I mean? <laughs> kind of thing, you know? So uh, this is what happens in, you know, human relationships. Right from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end, God is trying to get our attention. Right, right from the very beginning, every story, every interaction between God and man, he's trying to bridge this gap between divinity and humanity. Okay? So right from, the very, right from the very beginning. So Adam and Eve, he walks with them in the garden. right? So they have this very close relationship. But then after sin, when sin enters the world, the fall, then now there's a, now, now there's a gap. There's now a, 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 an abyss, dare I say, placed between God and man. There's a sin. So sin, I choose to do not God's will. I choose to do something else. So I've separated myself from God. Now there's, this, there's a gap. So what's he going to do? Well, he's trying to win the people back. So fast forward a wee bit and we're up to, we'll say, someone like Moses. God appearing to, to Moses in the form of a burning bush. So the bush, it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. So there's something supernatural going on here. It's God trying, God veiling his, his presence to be with, with Moses, but not consume him. But show at the same time, there's something supernatural going on here. Uh, same on, on Mount Tabor, you know, the, the, the supernatural experiences, encounters with God, where God reveals himself in a way that they can possibly understand. You know, pillars of cloud, pillars of fire, uh, all these kind of things. So God is trying to, trying to bridge this gap. Then in the prophets, through all of the prophets. Again, God trying to show his people, if you live this way, if you live according to my word, you will be my people, I will be your God, and you will be blessed in the land. You will have this blessing that you lost, this original blessing that you had in, in, in Eden before the fall. You will have this blessing. I will bless you. I will even make you my children. You know, it's, it's, it's an astounding reality. God constantly trying to bridge the gap between divinity and fallen humanity. So all of the law, all of the, 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 what, what the Jews would call the, the, the Torah, the first five books of, of scripture. So the law isn't there to just be, I don't know, kind of show us how to live arbitrarily, but it's there to, to, to try and bridge this gap between divinity and humanity. So. God wants to be merciful, to take care of the orphan and the poor, 
and to, 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 to learn how to live in, in obedience, so to serve the other out of love, right? So he wants us to live like him. He wants us to live in this way too. So if you live according to my law, you're becoming more like me. It's, you're bridging the gap. Okay, so the law, the prophets, the writings of, of, of the Old Testament, all of them are given to us to try and bridge this gap caused by sin between divinity and humanity. So God keeps reaching out to us in all sorts of different ways. And then through you know, various covenants, which have in, invariably are broken, and through the judges, which they all fall short, and so many of the kings, uh, in the books of Kings and Samuel, so many of them fall, fall short of the mark as well. But God continues just to reach out and establish a new covenant or, or reveal himself uh, through a, another prophet to try and, and, and bridge these gaps. So nothing really, nothing really worked for thousands of years. And then we have today. The incarnation where the Father reveals this, this plan. I have to be one like them. To walk like them. Talk like them without any swear words. I have to be one of them. Suffer like one of them. In order to bridge this gap. Because the gap now is so extreme, so vast that nothing else is going to work only God can fix it so the Lord takes on a human nature Jesus who is truly God now also becomes truly man so he was always God he existed from all time but in this moment in time he takes on a human nature he didn't have a human nature before the incarnation he was pure spirit like God the Father but now he takes on a human nature this is absolutely astounding. This is nothing short of incredible, unfathomable, to use a, the, that very divine mercy word. It's absolutely astounding that, that God would even think of doing this. This is, it's, it, it, it almost, and, and, and many, we're so used to it now, you know, we say to the angelus, you know, became flesh, and here we go, word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it, we say it like it's, it's completely normal. There's nothing, nothing normal about God becoming man. And uh, forgive me if I use this story, I've used it a couple of times, but it does help me to understand this. Like, where if you imagine, you know, your favorite, say you've got a dog at home, your rover, the golden retriever, right? And you're trying to, you want the, your, your, your golden retriever, rover, uh, to have a better life. So, so you're, you're, you're talking to him and you're saying, Rover, look, you've, I know it's springtime now, but you've got to stop wandering over to the neighbours, right? Because the neighbours have shot guns. Boom. And he says, he just look at you and go, <laughs> right? He doesn't get a word you say. I say, look, Rover, Rover, okay, you've got to stop eating from the neighbours' rubbish because if you keep knocking over their rubbish bins and tearing o open their trash, okay, they're going to kill you. And he goes, <laughs> And see that road out there? It's really busy ever since they opened the factory. There are trucks going up and down there every day. Don't play on the road. He looks at you and go, <laughs> he hasn't a clue what you're saying. And there's nothing you can do to actually communicate. Your, what you say makes sense. What you say is true. But his language is completely different. So he doesn't get it. So what if you could take on a canine nature, right? So you, you have your, your, your human intelligence. Otherwise, you're only as good as them. You can't help them because you're just a sheep like one of them or a dog like one of them. So you have this human intelligence and you become a dog like Rover. Now, that also has some kind of substantial negative consequences for you. You have to eat dog food. You have to live in a doghouse or outside. Although, to be honest, most dogs live in the lap of luxury, especially now in lockdown. They sleep on beds and everything. Where is he? Where is he? Ah, here we go. Ah, yeah. Crazy stuff. Uh, so, you know, but like you have to scratch yourself and, you know, like all this kind of thing. No showers and, and you know, you have to live the life of a dog. Not exactly pleasant. We can imagine then, you know, when you bring all of these new messages now 
to the dogs and say, lads, don't play on the road there, you know, the road is, road is bad. They go, oh, definitely bad, definitely bad. You know, don't, don't, eat, the, don't eat the neighbor's rubbish, you know what I mean? Because like the, the, they will shoot you if you jump over the fence, oh, definitely bad. Da, da. And you know, it's springtime, like wandering up there where there's also sheep and other dogs, like um, very unfriendly people up there, oh, da, definitely, da, yeah, bad. Okay, and they, they get it, like, because now you can speak their language, you speak canine, you speak dog, they get you. Okay, so this, this, is, this is good news, okay? But then, imagine after going through all of that, the humiliation of, of, of stepping down from human nature to canine nature, right? Imagine you do that, like, it's fairly astounding, not to mention impossible, but it's it fairly, like, it's, it's an incredible act of humility. Now, you have to live like one of them, but imagine after doing all of that, some of the dogs start to plot against you and say, who is this new dog here? Right, coming here with new fandangled ideas. Who do you think he is? We have always played on that road. That's our road. All right? This is our plot and our territory. Who's he to say, you can't play on the road? What does he know? He's not even from here. He's a blow-in. Right? And who's, who's he to say that we can't go eating the neighbor's rubbish? I found a half a pizza there yesterday. It was epic. All right? You can't eat the neighbor's rubbish. Who do you think he is? And we can't go up the fields now playing with the neighboring dogs. Sure. Have you seen... Thristle up there, and she's a lovely dog, right? <laughs> and they're happy out, like, you know. So, do you know what we'll do with this new dog now who thinks he's the bee's knees? What we'll do is we'll kill him. So after all of that, like, after all of that humiliation and all of that, that, that you know, desire that your dogs would live a good life, and you, you, you come and you reveal it and you speak in their language, they now decide to kill you. Now, you've, you have a human intelligence, so like you, can, you can see they're plotting and they're kind of prowling around. You, you, you do see it coming, like. What if you were to say, well, maybe if I die for them, then they would believe that I actually care. Then they would believe that I'm not just here as a, a smart preacher or teacher that read some, some good books and learned some good psychology, but maybe they'd believe that I actually, I actually mean it. And so you... you, you, you <laughs> You let it happen. They plot and they scheme, and one night they attack you and tear you to shreds. Like, it's, it's fairly astounding. And yet, the step down from human nature to canine nature, we're way closer to dogs than we are to God. Divine nature, it's so beyond us. And this is what Jesus does, steps down from divine nature and takes on a human nature, knowing right from the beginning that we were going to plan to kill him. It's just, it's just incredible. But this is the mystery of the incarnation. We, every, as I say, twice a day we pray the, the Angelus, or whenever we hear these readings, every uh, Easter when we, we listen to the, the accounts of the Passion, it just, we're so used to it. But this familiarity can breed contempt, and we can begin to think then that at the end of the day, sure, any, any form of any understanding of God is grand as long as you believe in something, which of course is complete rubbish. Because you can make up an idea of God which has nothing to do with the God that actually exists reaching down to humanity. This stuff is not made up. This stuff is given to us. God who exists is reaching out to us, calling us to be his children, calling us back to him, calling us into a relationship with him, calling us to heaven. But I didn't make up this idea. God has revealed himself this way. But if I fill in the blanks myself as to how I think God is, then I have an imaginary friend, and that's effectively idolatry. I've made up God. Made up gods, that's, they're idols. They don't exist. They're not real. But God has revealed himself to us in this way, and, and part of that, an essential part of that mystery is the incarnation. God becoming man. Everything about sacred scripture and tradition is about God trying to win our hearts, like we do to each other, especially if you're single and dating and all that kind of stuff. Trying to win someone's heart, trying to win someone's attention and their affection, ultimately trying to win their love. So all of scripture, all of tradition, is one great love story. And today's mystery of the incarnation makes this high point of that love story possible. Jesus takes on a human nature so that he can die in it. Jesus takes on a human nature so that he can suffer in it. So that no person will ever be able to say 
God, you don't know what it's like to be me. You don't know what it's like to suffer. You don't know what it's like to lose people. You don't know what it's like to die. Yes, he does. So we can never accuse God of being some distant, indifferent, powerful being up there in the clouds who doesn't really care about what goes on here. All of scripture is God reaching out to us. And from today's mystery on, God has revealed himself as not just creator, not just powerful, but immensely, incredibly, infinitely loving. So this is a great solemnity indeed. And so we ask the good Lord to renew our faith and that as this love story continues to unfold, may we respond to God's love for us with our love for him. Amen.